Okay, Mark, um, we've reached 935. I think we ought to begin our worship this morning. Welcome to worship. It's good to be with you, the people of Holy Trinity Lutheran Church, once again. I'm Pastor John Corgan, retired pastor, having served three different churches over 40 plus years. First, I was at Grace Lutheran Church in Washington, D.C., then Holy Cross Lutheran in Kennebunk, Maine, and then finally in uh, Hartford, Connecticut at Emanuel Lutheran Church. My wife, Deborah, and I now live in York, Maine, and we have five adult children, eight little grandchildren, ages eight down to six months. So we are feeling the effects of this COVID pandemic as all of us are. We miss seeing and hugging our grandchildren, but we're thankful for FaceTime, etc. And I'm thankful today that even though we can't be together in person, that uh, we can do this church service virtually. So again, good to be with you. Thanks for having me. Welcome to worship. Now we'll have our opening hymn, Now the Feast and Celebration. Now the feast and celebration, all of creation sings for joy. To the God of life and love and freedom, praise and glory forevermore. Now is the feast of the Lamb once slain, whose blood has freed and united us to be one great people of God. Now the feast and celebration all of creation sings for joy to the God of life and Lord and freedom praise and glory Wisdom and might, all of honor and glory to Christ forever. Now the feast and celebration, all of creation sings for joy. To the God of light and love and freedom, praise and glory forever. to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are raised with Christ to new life. So let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. In the desert, you promised pools of water for the parched, and you gave us water from the rock. At the cross, you watered us from Jesus' wounded side, and on this day, you shower us once again with the water of life. Bathe us in your forgiveness, grace, and love. Satisfy the thirsty, and give us the life only you can give. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ our Lord in the unity of the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. Pastor Corrigan will now lead us in the reading of the gospel. 
The Holy Gospel according to Matthew chapter 14. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but by this time the boat, battered by the waves, was far from land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Jesus said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God, the Gospel of the Lord. I'd just like to thank Pastor Corrigan again this morning for joining us and leading us in worship. Um, pastor Corrigan is a retired pastor of the ELCA, and he currently lives in York, Maine with his wife, has five adult children and five grandchildren and apparently um, is a, a once aspiring NBA player. Friends, grace, peace, and mercy to you this day and always. So the gospel text from Matthew tells us that Jesus walked on the water. Really? Jesus walked on the water? That reminds me of a wonderful movie, some of you may recall, I think from the 80s, Being There, starring Peter Sellers, who played the role of Chauncey Gardner. At the end of the movie, Chauncey Gardner walks across the pond. But here, this is no joke. This is Jesus in the Bible, in God's word for us, walking on the water. Today I want to talk to you about miracles, about believing, and what difference does it make? So then this question, is Christianity believable? Can we trust what it claims? Can we base our lives on us? Now, the story we have before us today, Jesus walking on the water, is one that certainly challenges our rational minds. There's a lot of resistance in us to such a story. Can you believe it? Some of you may be familiar with the name Francis Collins. Dr. Francis Collins is the director of the National Institutes of Health. He is Dr. Fauci's boss, if you will. Dr. Collins formerly was the director of the Human Genome, Genome Project. So he's a world-renowned scientist, well-regarded throughout the world. He's a smart guy, no doubt about it. And he is a person of faith, of Christian faith. He wrote a book, it's entitled The Language of God, in it, he offers his take on the intersection between science and faith. I commend it to you. I found it very helpful. So to the question, is Christianity believable? Dr. Collins offers some insights that I want to share with you in a moment. But first, let me tell you, Dr. Collins is a believer, but he was not always. He was raised in a non-religious home. He grew up in his young teen years thinking that he was an agnostic. That is one who believes there isn't enough knowledge to determine whether there's God or not. It comes from a Greek word, a meaning no, and gnosis meaning knowledge. Well, as he got a little bit older and into, more into his mid-teen years, uh, Francis Collins decided that he was an atheist, a theos, no God. So he was sure there was no God. As life led him to think more deeply and more critically about who he was and what he thought, and believed, he realized that atheism and agnosticism both were inadequate for him as a worldview. He began to read C.S. Lewis, particularly the book Mere Christianity, 
which for him was life-changing. He continued to think and study and reflect on life and himself and so forth, and he developed an understanding of what he believed, and it became a belief in the existence of God and specifically in the God who had revealed God to the world in Jesus. So first, to the question about the existence of God, is there a God at all? And maybe you've wondered that at times. Maybe you're wondering that right now. Many of us have wondered about that question throughout our lives. To that question, Dr. Collins makes two points that I want to touch on quickly. First, he cites the existence of the moral law. That is, a universal concern for right and wrong. And he says, if we human beings are merely the products of an evolutionary process, which he does believe in, without a doubt, but if we are merely the products of that process, where does the sense of right and wrong come from? And then secondly, Dr. Collins notes the existence of a drive within us, the sex drive. No, not really, but I mention that just to make sure you're paying attention in case you're wandering off. It's not the sex drive, but it's a drive equally forceful in us, a drive that seeks something or someone beyond us. Atheists will often claim that this drive or this God impulse is something we create because we can't handle life. We need something. And it's just a figment of our imaginations, a sort of wish dream. Dr. Collins says that such a wish dream, if that's all it is, would logically lead us to a certain kind of God. It would be a benevolent God, a God on our side, a cozy God, a God who would please us, would do whatever we wanted, would make no demands on us. A God that comes from our wish dream would never produce the God of the Bible or the God of Jesus. A wish dream of our making would never lead to the God who calls us to do things like lay down our lives to follow Jesus or to serve others, to care for the poor, to give away our possessions, to love our neighbors, even our enemies, all of which Jesus calls his followers to do. No, this God impulse within us, this drive, may not be a wish dream at all, but in fact, may be a basic innate part of who we are, our human nature. Dr. Collins, quote, could it be that this longing for the sacred, a universal and puzzling aspect of human experience, may not be wish fulfillment, but rather a pointer towards something beyond us? Why do we have a God-shaped vacuum in our hearts and minds unless it's meant to be filled? Close quote. St. Augustine, centuries ago, described this yearning. Quote, my heart is restless until it finds its rest in thee, that is, in God. Close quote. To the specific question about Jesus and miracles, Dr. Collins' line of thinking goes this way. If you believe in God, that is, the creator of all that ever was and ever will be and ever is, if God is the creator of everything, that is, if God is God, then suspending the laws of nature on this tiny planet called Earth would be well within that God's skill set, don't you think? According to John's Gospel, the purpose behind the miracles was to point to God present and active in Jesus. It's like God shouting to the world, here I am. If you want to know about God, about who I am as God, look to this one, Jesus and learn from what he does, what he says, how he lives. So is Christianity believable? Can we believe it? Many, many have, and many still do. Francis Collins, for one, C.S. Lewis, you could name many, many, of course. You've known people in your lifetime, as I have, smart, intellectually gifted, critical in their analysis of life, people of strong character and conviction, people who used their lives to try to make a better world. And they did so because of their faith in God, the God of Jesus Christ. So it's clear to me, you don't have to surrender your brain, your intellect, your ability to reason in order to have faith. But what is it we're believing in anyway? 
trusting him. A few disclaimers first. The God of Jesus Christ is not some sort of magician God who doles out special gifts and toys to you and others because you've been good. This God is not a God whose goal is to bless and prosper rich white people while the rest of the world suffers. This is not a God of a cold, lifeless religion of rules and regulations, demands and requirements. And this God of Jesus Christ is not a partisan God who favors the United States over other nations. This is not a God who has a preference for America as some sort of new Israel, the chosen people of God. This nationalistic, self-serving claim of some who call themselves Christian has absolutely no basis in scripture, certainly nothing in any of Jesus' teachings. No, this is not the Christianity based on Jesus' life and teachings. Christianity, what is it? First and foremost, it's about Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. Martin Luther gave us a great image. He said, the Bible is like the cradle that holds the Christ child. In Jesus, God made God's decisive move toward humanity, showing love, mercy, and compassion. In Jesus, God came to heal broken people like you and me, and to heal a broken world through a life, a death, and a resurrection. So what difference does it make, believing? Believing means, for one thing, that we're not alone. The human journey is not intended to be a solo trip. In fact, we were made for relationship, for love. The yearning deep within us is satisfied in this God in Christ Jesus who came. Believing also gives purpose to life. People who follow Jesus faithfully do certain things. They love God and they love their neighbor, all of them without exception. The story of the Good Samaritan comes to mind. You remember the injured person? Two religious people walk by on the other side, and then the Samaritan comes to help. So if we believe in Jesus, we live for God and for others. Here's the thing. If we believe, then our lives should show it, shouldn't they? I grew up in a wonderful church great pastors, terrific people, Bible study going on, youth groups, basketball teams. Yes, basketball teams. I think I loved my church for that almost more than anything. We had many wonderful times. It was a great church. But as I grew up in the 50s and 60s, there was a lot of unrest in our country, but it was a bit muffled. You didn't hear a lot about it. And I must say, I never heard anything in church at least I don't recall it, that had to do with racial injustice, racial discrimination in our society. I don't think I ever heard a word about it. I don't think I ever heard a sermon that called us to be concerned about the victims of racial injustice. But there was lots of racial injustice. In 1960, a little six-year-old girl named Ruby Bridges lived in New Orleans with her family. Her family had agreed that they would take her to an elementary school that was being desegregated. There were other black families that agreed to do the same, but they backed out. So it was only Ruby Bridges, six-year-old girl and her mother, who would walk to this elementary school each day. They had to be escorted by four marshals. Why? Because the sidewalks to that school were lined with row after row of angry white people yelling vulgarities, obscenities at this little girl. Can you imagine? Why? Well, because she wasn't white. Can you imagine? And Ruby said that didn't scare her so much, but what did was she saw one white woman with an angry face who had a black baby doll that she had put into a small coffin and was holding up for Ruby to see. Can you imagine if that was your little six-year-old girl? 
Then in 1963, I think it was, in Birmingham, Alabama, the 16th Street Baptist Church was bombed. It was bombed because the people there were not white. As a result of the bombing, you may remember, four young girls were killed, 11 years old through 14 years old, these four girls. Can you imagine if one of them had been your daughter? Why was that done, that bombing? Again, because the people who went to that church were not white. In my ministry, I confess to you that I was not direct enough in challenging myself and the people in my congregations to deal with the realities of racial injustice in our society. We've been far too quiet, have said far too few words about what's really been happening to our neighbors. You know, neighbors, the Good Samaritan. We church people have found it far too easy to walk by on the other side. But we're called to be like the Good Samaritan. So to me, this much is indisputable, and I direct this as much to myself as to you. It is a failure of our faith when we ignore the suffering and pain of others. It's our failure. It is a failure of our faith when we choose to be passive in the face of violence and injustice. It is our failure. It is our failure and a failure of our faith when we are content to be content or to walk by on the other side. We may say we believe, but do our lives show it? God's radical love for all people is pushing and pulling people like you and me toward all those people who are in need, if we will but pay attention. There are people yearning to know God and to experience God's love for them, the love you've experienced, perhaps. And so the question is, how will we respond to God's call to extend that love of God to others? How will we respond to the many, many who are suffering from the effects of racism in our society and world today? What are you and I going to do about it? And how will we respond to the many who are suffering terribly because of this pandemic? What are we going to do about it? So what do you think? Is it believable? Can you believe? Jesus on the water, Jesus rising from the dead, God, the reality behind all of life. Well, the God made known in Jesus is a pursuing God. God never gives up. God is always seeking us out to give us faith, life, and hope. God came in Jesus to love people to draw them into relationship with their God and with one another. Now to me, that's a God to believe in. That's a God to love. That's a God to serve with our lives. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Corrigan. Our service continues with the offering. Again, we'd like to share with everyone that we reached our goal of $16,000 to increase our social ministry giving for this year. Uh, in fact, we exceeded it by almost $1,000. And this year, the social ministry at Holy Trinity will send out over $50,000 to help those in need. And we're very thankful and appreciative of, every, of everyone's offering and continuation of they're giving during this pandemic. As you can see, there are several ways to continue to give to the church, um, either dropping it off or mailing it, using the Alexo app, using the uh, website, giving online, or being able to uh, text. So once again, thank you very much for your gifts. Our service continues with the prayers of the people. And for our prayers today, we're going to have a visual prayer with music by Aaron Strumpel. And please use the chat feature to type in your prayers uh, during this time, or you can simply allow the poem uh, to be your prayer. And, and at the end, I'll offer a prayer for all of us. Trust in you. Our hope is 
Dear Lord, we remember all those people who have been mentioned in their prayers today. And we pray for comfort and healing for all those who are sick or suffering, for all who have lost their job and are out of work we pray that they may find fulfilling employment. Help us to remember and actively care for those who it can be easy to forget. The poor, the homeless, the sick, and all who have no one to care for them. We remember and give thanks for the lives of all of our departed friends and relatives and loved ones. Especially today, we remember Paul, Pastor Paul Lindstrom and remember Anita and his family. We give thanks for Pastor Tim and his family and pray that they may enjoy rest and renewal during their vacation and have safe travels and return to us safely. Amen. We continue our service with remembrance of communion. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. During this time of being physically distant, 
May we remember that God's promises of love and forgiveness are not rooted in our actions and abilities. They are firmly planted in God's action through the Holy Spirit. When we have gathered for worship in the past, we've heard the words, blood of Christ shed for you, body of Christ given for you. Those words are as true today as they were the first time you heard them or the last time you heard them, whether that was March 15 in our sanctuary or decades ago in a church that may no longer exist. God's love and forgiveness comes through us, to us, through the word and sacrament, through our time of exile from the church building as we fast from the sacraments. May we rely solely on the word of God to do what it says, love and forgive. Amen. Let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. A few announcements this morning. Our weekly outdoor gatherings will um, pick up again this week. On Tuesday, there'll be a gathering from 7 to 7.30 under the tent and you need to sign up in advance for that. Um, there'll be music, you know, singing, um, conversation about the sermon and gospel lesson. And then also Pastor Tim will lead a gathering Wednesday morning for children, but all are invited certainly. And that starts at 11 o'clock. We'll receive communion next Sunday, August 16th and you're invited to come to the church and pick up communion elements in the building. You can see a photograph of the table there that's set up in the gathering area. And if you need them delivered, contact the church office and arrangements will be made to get them to you. An update on our pop-up pantry. This is a ministry that we began um, about six weeks ago. Uh, two, Sunday, uh, two, two weeks ago, uh, 11 of 15 bags that were put out on a table in front of the church were taken. And last week uh, on Thursday, we put out 11 bags and all 11 bags were taken uh, by folks. Um, Christina Dolcino has been heading this up and doing a wonderful job. And, and Paulette has been uh, working with Christina in that ministry. Um, we can always use more, use more food donations. So you'll see on the slide the kinds of things that are helpful. So please, uh, there's clearly a need and word is getting out that we're providing food uh, in front of the church on Thursday morning. So uh, if you're able, uh, when you go shopping, please pick up some extra food and drop it off at the church office. Um, again, we're currently putting out the table uh, on Thursday mornings. We bring it in at the end of the day. Um, and, and again, thank you for all those who are supporting this important ministry. Just a reminder about Luther Crest Bible Camp. It looks like this coming week is the last week of this online Bible Camp. So there's still an opportunity to participate. As a reminder, if you'd like to sit in the sanctuary, you're very welcome to do that. You just need to sign up on the Sign Up Genius link uh, it, that you'll find in the Tidings email or at our website. Um, and there'll be safety guidelines that you'll want to follow. Uh, and we thank you in advance for, for doing so. So please come and spend time in the sanctuary as, as you're moved to do so. Ah, birthdays, uh, or the annual declaration of being awesome. Who would like to declare their awesomeness? Please do so through the chat feature, and uh, we'll 
celebrate with you birthdays and anniversaries. And as we're, um, ah, yes, Carl turned 18, Carl Moore, uh, on August 8th. Happy birthday, Carl. A recent graduate of Oyster River High School and good friend of our family. I, and, and I would just like to mention that uh, as I, I did earlier, Pastor Tim and his family are returning from vacation and he'll be back with us this week. And again, we're so grateful during this time of the pandemic that they were still able to get away and visit with their fa extended families out West. Kurt's birthday is tomorrow. Congratulations, Kurt. And John Berg's is today. Old enough to be Nana. Nana to no one, Eric. Thank you. Emily's got better reading eyes than I do with the small print. So we'll conclude our formal service with our sending him Great is Thy Faithfulness and happy birthday and anniversary to all those folks celebrating at this time. and sending from Pastor Corrigan. Thanks so much for having me today as your pastor. It's been a pleasure and an honor to be with you. Now receive this blessing of God. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. Now go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.
All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us for worship this morning. It was great to see everybody. Uh, we'll now uh, have an opportunity for some fellowship for those that would like to stay on. Um, the question to chat about this week, if you choose to do so with your group, is what was your first car? And to share a memory about it. And Pastor Tim has shown us a photo of his first car, which when I first saw this slide yesterday, a 1983 Volkswagen Rabbit, ironically, was not my first car, but was my car in law school. So I can relate to that little, that little machine right there. So I uh, hope everyone has a wonderful day and a great week.